On behalf of Namitha Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, welcome back to JLF's Brave New World, Season 2. A magazine partner for this series is The Week, Journalism with a Human Touch. Those of you who missed our earlier episode, uh, Dystopian Realities, Writing Rural Distress, Namitha Weicker, and Nilima Kota in conversation with Namitha Bhandare, can catch it on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Litfest JLF, or on our Facebook page, JLF Litfest where you can also find all our earlier sessions. Our next session for the day is The Silence of Sherazade, Daphne Suman in conversation with Mansi Subramaniam. Turkish novelist Daphne Suman, magical novel Silence of Sherazade, tells the intertwining story of a Levantine, a Greek, a Turkish, and an Armenian family in the turbulent years 1905 to 1922, told through the voice of a mysterious narrator, the mute Sherazade. In conversation with Mansi Subramaniam, the author speaks of this unforgettable story of a forgotten time and of the stories behind the stories. Daphne Suman was born in Istanbul, where she completed her graduate studies in sociology. After her MA thesis, she left Turkey and traveled the world as a volunteer teacher of social sciences. She wrote travel journals, short stories, and novels. Her books are an inspiration for young women in Turkey who dream about breaking the conventional lifestyles and living freely. Manasi Subramaniam is executive editor and head of literary rights at Penguin Random House India. Just to remind you, all our sessions that have been broadcast till now are available on our Facebook page, JLF Lit Fest and on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Litfest JLF. Please do remember to ask questions and comment by typing it into the comment section below, and Mansi will post the same to our speaker. In case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our Facebook and YouTube channels. Ladies and gentlemen, the silence of Sherazade, Daphne Suman in conversation with Mansi Subramaniam. Mansi, over to you. Thank you, Sanjoy. And hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here in conversation with Daphne Suman, the author of The Silence of Shehrzad. Welcome, Daphne. Hello, everybody. So, I, um, before we begin, uh, I, think it's, I think it's important that we also point out that like the author, Daphne, uh, The Silence of Shahrazad is a book that is very much about the confluence of cultures. So Daphne lives between Istanbul and Athens, two really beautiful cities. And much of the book is about um, the cultures, the meeting of cultures, uh, particularly the Greeks and the Turkish, uh, and also some of the conflicts that arise as a result. The Silence of Shehrzad is about a hundred-year-old woman, uh, Shehrzad, who is telling us her story. Uh, she's been silent for the last 80 years, and she's telling us particularly about some of the events that, takes that take place in her life between the years 1905 and 1922. Uh, she's talking to us from the year 2000, uh, 2005, is that right? Perfect. So, uh, and one of the things that I absolutely found fascinating about this novel is this, this exact aspect. Shehrazad has been silent for all of these years. And then at the age of 100, she begins to write her own story. I want to begin by asking you, Daphne, to tell us a little bit about the setting of your novel, which is the ancient city of Smyrna, which is now Izmir in Turkey. Uh, mm -hmm. I found, I found it amazing that the city itself is sort of brought out in a way that it's almost a character in the novel. It's so central to every part of the novel that, you know, Smyrna is as much a character as anyone else. Tell us a little bit about why the city captured your imagination. Well, thank you, first of all. I'm, I'm honored to be here in the Jaipur Literature Festival. And a wonderful question. And it's actually the heart of the book I wanted, to, I wanted to put Smyrna, which is a fascinating, which was a fascinating cosmopolitan city at the center of my book. And I wanted every character kind of, it was like a star in the middle and every character was kind of sharing some part of the light of Smyrna. And therefore even the Shehrazad, the narrator of our story is 
represented as Smyrna, uh, really her genetics. I wanted to find, the whole plot came from how can I make a character which carries every segment, eth ethical, uh, ethical and religious segment of Smyrna together in one person. I was thinking about that. And that's how the character of Shehrazad came, came about. <laughs> Uh, yeah. The opening scene of your book is, it kind of draws you in immediately. We, uh, we begin and we are introduced to the narrator who is still in the womb of her mother. And we slowly begin to find out more about her life. But also what's fascinating is that we're on board a ship and we meet this dashing Indian spy called Avinash Pillai. The entire setting is vi really vivid. How did this opening scene come to you? Um. I, I think the whole book came to me with the opening scene. I really wanted to write that opening scene because the desire was so much at that time that I wanted to live in the old Smyrna. Um, so I wanted to, as, a, as an author, my only time machine is either writing or reading about some old times and some old cities. So... Um, so I decided to write in order to live there and I wanted to enter the city like I'm the author and entering into this world. So I picked an outsider and Avinash Pillai is an outsider, but not so much outsider because he's going to make Smyrna his home and he, he will carry Smyrna in his heart, just like the way I do. I am not from Smyrna. I'm not from Izmir. But I carry that old cosmopolitan image in my heart. So that's how we enter from its harbor. And it's a harbor town. So all its beauty in sunset is like a gold. It's called the Pearl of the Orient back, back in the day. So that pearl shining in the, the sun setting in the golden light of the sunset is in front of us and I wanted to have a, a grand opening to town and to the book. So tell us about Avinash Pillai. I'm sure everyone wants to hear <laughs> how this Indian spy found his way to Smyrna. Well, like I said, I wanted an outsider because Smyrna back in the days, in the, during the Ottoman Empire times, Smyrna had a very distinctive communities, meaning Levantine community, Catholics, and then Protestants, um, Orthodox Greeks, Armenians, Orthodox Armenians, Catholic Armenians, Jewish um, neighborhoods, and the Muslim neighborhoods where mostly Turkish people live. And they live together, all together, next to one another. I, I don't want to say like connectedly, they weren't connected much, but they lived together. And I wanted an outsider, not one of these communities, somebody and I was thinking who could that be it was actually my husband's idea how about an Indian spy and I said why not and then his name came to us automatically let's Avinash Avinash Pillai <laughs> and that's our that's how one of the main characters of the novel uh, turned out to be an Indian spy who works for the British Empire and he's central to the plot, as we'll find out uh, until the absolute end. Uh, Avinash holds many of the threads of the novel together. Uh, I'll let all of you find out when you read the book. But yeah, I mean, Avinash brings the story to Shehraza. That's why actually he has the key role. Like when you think about it, how can this woman, a hundred year old woman living in a tower, know about these things? You know, as a realistic reader, I would ask this. Avinash mm. is the answer. Like. He knows, he researches, he lives, and he's a spy. He has resources. So he knows, and he brings the story to Sheikh Razan. And this cosmopolitan city of Smyrna, which you bring out so vividly, uh, is, when you travel to Izmir now, what is, what is it like? Do you still see sort of the ghost of the old Smyrna? Ghost is the right word, yes. You see the ghost of the old Smyrna because... Izmir is one of the most beautiful cities of Turkey today. And it's very modern, it's very progressive, amazing, still the beauty. But there's a rupture, a historical rupture between the, the cosmopolitan times of Smyrna and nationalist Izmir. National, let's not call nationalist, but the Izmir of nation state of Turkish Republic today. There's a very 
uh, aggressive rupture that took place in history where people of Smyrna, that cosmopolitan uh, population of Smyrna is emptied out of town in a matter of seven days and replaced by a single ethnically, single language speaking community of what we have today, mostly 99% Turkish speaking um, Turkish people. So, so you see only ghosts of the old times. If you really look, what you see is actually a big, um, it's kind of like an erasing of history. You see everything is very new. The street names are gone. Um, the old buildings are gone. It's not like Istanbul. Izmir is a very new, very young town. And you understand history, some part of the history is taken, is ex extracted from this town. And that's what you feel when you go there. And that so, was my first motivation to start writing. Like something, there's a feeling of loss here in the air, in the sea. In the middle of this beauty, young people, happy people, there's loss here. And that's how I started doing research and deciding to write this novel. So it's a city that's both extremely young and extremely old then. And that's, uh, that's correct, yeah. And much of, the, much of the novel talks also about the racial tension uh, in the city, particularly during these very turbulent years um, before the war and during. So uh, can you give us a little bit of context for this uh, and why it is that that is so central to the novel? Okay, of course. Um, and it's a good question. And um, so Smyrna is in the southwest of Asia Minor. It's a very rich town uh, throughout the history because it has very good produce of figs. It has tobacco, it has grapes, like it's a rich place. And during the Ottoman Empire, it's one of the richest harbor towns. And even back then, there's a lot of competition economically who's going to rule Smyrna, British or French. Um, so that mostly the competition is between them. And then um, during the First World War, Ottoman Empire loses the war and loses its land. And Smyrna is given to the European, um, the winning part of the uh, First World War. And they gave, give it to Greece. So they say, okay, this part of Asia Minor, Greece will administer. And that creates a big disappointment in the Turkish side. Although the population of Smyrna was at that point time, at least 40% of people of Greek origin. And um, so naturally it was a Greek administration would take place when they were dividing Asia Minor between the, you know, the allies. And um, that creates tension and uh, Turkish Greek war begins, which we call today Turkish independence war. So the whole today's Turkey is based on winning the war and making the land, Asia Minor, or what we call Anatolia, uh, making the, that land belonging to the Republic of Turkey again. So Smyrna is always, is it ours? Is it theirs? Is it us? We're going to get it? No, we will get it. So that creates a tension, which is pure politics. Mm. At the level of people, people who live there, like I said before, Turks and Greeks, Armenians and Levantines that are Catholic and Protestant, Jewish people, they live all together happily, free from the politics. Um, so the, this tension was not between the people of Smyrna. This tension is somewhere high above imposed and of course affected the lives of people of Smyrna forever. So Smyrna and the people of Smyrna become like political pawns constantly being handed over from one power yeah, to like the other. Like always and like everywhere. That's right, because I can see so many parallels from all over the world, including, of course, from India. So it's, I mean, it's really powerful the way you just described how um, the people have no control over who they end up belong, where they end up belonging. Uh, yeah, I, it's always the people's destiny that changes at the end. Yeah. Uh, one of the pivotal events in the book is the Great Fire of Smyrna, which takes place in September 1922. And it 
lasts for five days and it happens at the end of three years of war. So uh, could you tell us a little bit about, about the historical event and also how it plays out in the novel? Yeah. Um, so September 20, 1922 is the end of the Turkish-Greek war. Greek army in defeat runs away um, and Smyrna is the western border of Turkey. So Greek army is retre retreating and coming to Smyrna and Greece sends ships and they are taken immediately on the 6th, 7th, 8th of September. They're taken away from the um, Smyrna's shores. Turkish army enters, that's the 9th of September, and there are hundreds of Greek and Christian populations of Asia Minor and population of Smyrna out in the harbor waiting for more Greek ships to come and take the civilians. Of course, those Greek ships never come. And mainly because it's hard, like they are already taking all the soldiers. But secondly, the Turkish army says the moment a Greek ship enters these waters, we're going to consider it as an enemy and we will shoot it. So then 9th of September, um, half a million people, they say, half a million people are on the small not small, it's a long one, but it's a narrow uh, seashore. They're all there camping because their villages are burnt um, during the war. And then on the 13th, that's four days after the arrival of Turkish army and taking administration, uh, the city starts to burn. And the, the wind, Smyrna has a very famous wind. And the wind is, is a character in the book too. The wind picks and takes the fire down towards the sea where half a million people are camping outside and waiting for the Greek ships. And the Turkish soldiers hold the two ends of that narrow but long seashore. So the people don't have anywhere to go. Behind them is the fire, in front of them is the sea and two sides are the Turkish soldiers holding. So they, most of them, they jump to the sea and that's how they die. Um, and, and it's a very tragic part. In Greece, it's called the, the Megali Catastrophe, which means the, the greatest disaster in history, in the Greek history. Um, so that's the fire. And in Turkey, still it's the controversy who started the fire and Outside of Turkey, you don't have that controversy. Only inside of Turkey, you have that controversy. And when I was doing the research, um, one thing I find, okay, there are many eyewitnesses saying that Turkish soldiers, so Turkish soldiers putting uh, petroleum in cert around, Turkey, around certain neighborhoods. But if you leave it aside, if those eyewitnesses are also not true, let's say, the neighborhoods that burned that, those five days are only Greek neighborhoods and Armenian neighborhoods. They became flat, like nothing has left after those. And what didn't burn, and it's like as if a knife is cutting, what didn't burn was the Jewish neighborhoods, Italian Levantine neighborhoods, and the Turkish neighborhoods. Nothing happened to them. Not a single house is burned. So that makes us think um, the fire was actually a way of getting rid of the Smyrna's Greek and Armenian populations. And, and that's what happened at the end. And how is the event viewed today? How is the event viewed? What did viewed, you say? Uh, how is the event viewed today? Um, like when we're look, looking from the perspective of today, how, how is the event viewed in Turkey? What? Well, in Turkey, it's still the Greeks set fire and they left. That's the so, official so history. Greeks set fire and they left. So and we didn't start we the fire. That's, that's what we learned in school as children. But then I looked like, why would Greeks set fire in their own neighborhoods, in their own peoples? Like there are Turkish, Greeks, Greek army, let's not call it Greeks, but Greek army and retreating soldiers they did put fire in many Turkish villages as they, are, they were running away. That's a, that's a fact and, and it's, it's obvious there. But the burning of Smyrna doesn't make sense. Mm. But that's the official history in Turkey. 
So it's uh, we didn't start the fire, basically. No, no, we never, question. never, never. <laughs> and that's the only thing spoken. Who started the fire? It wasn't us. It was them. It was Armenians. As if like this is the only thing to speak. There is a human tragedy taking place at the same time. 500,000 people stuck in a small sea line and trying to save their lives and their children, women and old people who walked from the villages of Asia Minor with hopes that Greece will send them ships, send them ships and, and deport them from there. That's the real tragedy. I don't know, I don't care who started the fire when there is that, those mm. people standing there or trying to save their lives in that little seashore. So in the novel, we hear about this, this cat catastrophic event uh, from the perspective of, your, of the narrator, Shehrzad. And I think, uh, I mean, it's also interesting that Shehrzad, uh, as from, from mythology, from like the Arabian Nights, is the character who uh, told a different story every night for 1001 nights. And she does this in order to save her life. And your Shehrzad, uh, at the age of 100, finally decides to tell her own story. And she's been silent for a very long time, but she decides to start writing her own story. So even though she doesn't, she continues not to speak and she's still silent, is this in a way um, like, like her namesake? Is she trying to save her own life by telling the story? Um, she's trying to die. So that's the paradox about my Shehrazad. My Shehrazad, she's not able to die. She, is, she says, I'm forgotten in a mansion in a dilapidated mansion and death is not finding me. And Avinash actually, Avinash who brings the story to, to Shehrazad and telling her, look, this is who you are actually. You think you were this other person, but let me tell you the truth. This is who you are. So write this down, otherwise the death will never, fi never find you and you will live like, like an old woman in this mansion. Um, so she needs to speak in order to free herself, let's say, freeing herself from your old body. So she's looking for freedom, but not through life, but through death. So she wants to get out of this life, maybe getting ready for the next one, but she needs to speak and tell her story. So that's what she's doing. But the, the silence of Shehrazad is, is a metaphor for the silence we have in Turkey about the past. In this specific example, the, the past of Smyrna, that tragedy that I have just spoken in the official history, we just say, okay, we won the war as the Turkish army. And then we, we took the Greeks out to the sea. That's like the official thing, which is true, but nobody says those Greeks were actually children and old grandmas and grandpas and women they were trying to save their lives and the locals of the land not army or soldiers so this silence around what happened in the beginning of the republic a beginning of the foundation of turkish republic is something um as a novelist i'm trying to break and shehrzad uh, frees herself by breaking her silence and so is that also a way of saying that if we speak the truth, if we stop uh, a kind of denial, then we, we too will free ourselves? Absolutely. Yeah. You can think about it at the individual level. If you're, you know, if you're holding a secret from your mm. childhood and the moment you start talking about that, you're free. Your soul finds liberation by getting rid of that uh, secret. Yeah. Yeah. Or the, sometimes you don't know, your family has a secret and then you find out and you start talking about it and you feel free even though you have no part of that secret. So we only have a little bit of time left. Uh, I have so many more questions I want to ask. So I want to kind of quickly jump to the fact that this is a work of historical fiction and you've used uh, a very specific set of historical events in which to set your story. What's the kind of research that's involved in creating something like this? Well, the research took me two years and everything, journals of the times, diaries, newspapers. I, I worked in New York a lot. I was in the U.S. when I was writing it. Also, of course, I came to Athens 
Um, I worked in, in Izmir in libraries. I read um, newspapers. I have a very good friend. He's super into everything about Smyrna. He gave me all the feedback about the buildings, about life. So as I was writing, I was also doing the research in three countries, in Turkey, in the U.S., and in Greece. It was fun. And uh, in terms of writing a historical novel, uh, I've often heard historical novelists in particular talk about how important it is to understand the past with empathy, to find out how we got to where we are right now. Did you find that it helped you understand the present moment to, read, to learn about the past and write about it? Of course, because, you know, when you write about it, you say, oh, how terrible it was, how, how mean people were. Same thing is happening. It's the same C, a G and C now, again, facing a lot of refugees, people escaping from war, the Syrian refugees in Turkey, and, and they're there and we're not even seeing mm. um, their misery. And as I was writing that, I started to see the same thing is happening. It, this history is just repetition. Look at this. Again, this sea is swallowing people as hundreds of people are dying in the same sea, trying to cross to Greece again, hoping help from Europe. And so I started to see today with all uh, its catastrophic futures, just like 100 years ago. I mean, I, I can only hope that we learn from Shehrzad and learn to break our silence about so much of what is happening around us in every part of the world. Mm. Uh, I, I always uh, end with one question, which is, do you have any recommendations of books that our readers and listeners mm -hmm. would like to read? So, it, I mean, uh, books from Turkey, books, historical novels, anything that inspired you? Well, when I was writing this book, um, the Marquis is a hundred years of sol solitude was my, of course, number one inspiration because it's a hundred years of silence now we're talking about. Um, and then um, Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children. Again, it was a big inspiration for me. Arundhati Roy's The God of the Small Things, always my number one inspiration. Um, Middlesex, Jeffrey Eugenides starts in Smyrna. Uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why I started. Um, and from Turkey, I'm a big fan of Orhan Pamuk, our novelist, and um, all of his books, I would say. But in uh, historical fiction, his My Name is Red is a book I really love. And also a novel that's so much about the confluence of culture, uh, My Name is Red. Uh, yes, yes, particularly absolutely. how we borrow art from each other's cultures. That's Isn't it absolutely amazing? fascinating. So yeah. your novel was published both in Turkey and in Greece at the same time? Yes, uh, at the same day. On the same day, which yes. if I remember correctly, also happens to be your birthday. Yes, <laughs> it was an amazing coincidence. So uh, can you also tell us a little bit about how the novel is was what the reception was like in these two very different countries. And of course, the book was also about Greeks and Turkish. So what was the difference in reception? In Turkey, amazing reception. People were like, thank you. We didn't know about that, but we always felt that. Now we're talking, oh, I'm shocked. Like this really happened. Yes, they did happen. In Greece, because it's a very well-known story, but never from a Turkish side, and in Greece, there were things that they didn't know anything about. So they were always like, oh, something terrible happened to us. But then when you give the historical context, you understand that, no, it's not black and white. Things had to happen in a way because there was a very big political play taking place. So let's stop blaming just one side. This is what you did to us. Now they see the gray tones in between the sides. So that was also an awakening for them. They said, oh, we never know. But yeah, now it makes much, much more sense. We're not the victims of just one thing, but it's a, it's a big game. And now the English translation will be out next year? Next year, I think in spring, it's coming the English translation. I'm very excited about it. It will be available in all English-speaking countries. 
Um, and, and I would like to actually say my thanks to my translator because I work with a wonderful woman, Elizabeth Göksel, and she's translating all my books. We work together. She translates, she sends me a chapter. And if she's watching, I'd like to offer my gratitude to her. So I was lucky enough to read the English translation uh, ahead of publication. And it, is, it really is a wonderful, wonderful translation. I wish I could read the original, but the translation is really wonderful. I know, it's, it's really good. So on that note, we've got uh, questions coming in from the audience. Um, okay. Zoya asks, uh, as, you, as you write, love is better experienced when one is alone. One experiences the feelings better in solitude. Do you, do you think that love in general is being in solitude? Mm. I think everything is experienced better in solitude. For me, it's a personal thing. When I'm with people, I'm in the moment of how is the relationship going? When I'm alone, I say, okay, what happened now? What did I feel? I was excited and, and the, the, what really happened comes to me when I'm alone and really digesting things. That includes love. Okay, and the next question, Rahul Sharma asks, was it difficult to write an objective approach to, uh, was it difficult to write an objective approach to events uh, having lived in Turkey and in Greece? No. It wasn't the objective, it's your center. If at your center you have, I think we all have a human center that can see the right and wrong, just and unjust from one another. So I just stayed at my center and from there I looked. So I, I was thinking I was gonna receive more resistance from Turkey, but it didn't come at all. People were right. very receiving and very well, the book, is very well received in Turkey. So that gave me a lot of courage for the future of Turkey and its young people. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah. Um, right, the next question. Okay, I think there's something wrong with my screen. So I'm going to put on my glasses. There you go, I... glasses. <laughs> okay, uh, Mitva Verma asks, were fairy tales such as 1001 Nights and the story of Shehrzad inspiration for you to write the book? It's inspiration for all of us who live in the Middle East. It's our, it's, it's our culture. That's where we learn to tell stories. Always an inspiration. Sabah Abdul asks, how did you research about Smyrna from antiquity and how different was it from the Izmir of the present age? Well, I, I only did research for the times like 18th century, a little bit 19th century and 20, early 20th century. So I didn't go back to the very past. Um, there is enough resources. There, there are even films from the early 20th century. And there's Europeans leave very good traces, like they're good archival people. So I was mm. able to reach a lot of European resources, hard Turkish resources, um, it was harder to find. And for those things, because the Turkish neighborhoods are still alive, I went to Izmir and I found whatever I was looking for in the streets of all Turkish neighborhoods. Um, Ria asks, do you believe your travels have impacted your writing and your researching style? And my travels impacted who I am. It, um, so like whatever right is an extension of myself, my psyche, my soul. So of course, all my travels, like being able to see the whole world and different people and, and finding the same center in every human being, it did help me to write, yes. Right. Um, Rijul Saxena asks, um, have you read any books by Indian writers? Yes, like I said, Salman yeah. Rushdie, I love. Arundhati Roy is my literature mother. Um, Kiran Desai, I read. Um, so I have, I love Indian literature very much. And I try to follow uh, because I find India and Turkey very similar. And although India has a, a more, a, a richer literature, cul a narrative culture, um, whenever I read from India, for example, when I re read The God of Small Things, it was as if you can take the same story to Turkey. 
and I can write that story too. So in that respect, I really like the literature being produced in India. I find it and, very close to my heart. And I know you teach yoga as well. Yes, I'm a, I teach yoga and I'm a student of yoga. I'm a student of Hatha Yoga. Um, so that's another, that's why India is also very close to my heart. Um, Kavya asks, have you been writing during the pandemic and how are you dealing with this difficult situation? Uh, it's so hard. I don't think I'm dealing, it, dealing with it very gracefully. I have fights with my husband very often. Um, but I've been writing, yes. Actually, my new novel is coming up in next week or in two weeks. First in Turkish and then in other languages, hopefully. Yes, I did write and it's taking place in the future. Oh, wow. Yes. So from the and past there, to the future. Yes, exactly. From 100 years ago, now we're going to 100 years in the future. So and yes, I spent is it also set in Turkey? Writing. Uh, we don't know. In okay. no, no more names of countries left in 100 years. So there is only the land. That might be a good thing. Yeah, may. Well, you'll read and you'll see. <laughs> um, Sri Lata asks, do you think the translations of your work have held on to the original? Yes. When I work with my translator, um, like I said, she's an amazing woman. She sends me every chapter and I read every ch chapter. And if there is, there is um, something to be improved, I always uh, improve it. And therefore, it's kind of keeping my rhythm and my sayings, like the way I say things, it's also reflected in English. Of Same I can do in Greek, but other languages, of course, I don't know. I have to choose to trust the translators in other countries that they have the same rhythm and same heart to express. So you do read in Greek as well? Yes, I do. I live in Greece. I, yeah. I speak the language. Yeah. So... Um... Okay, I think we're waiting for a couple of more questions to come in. But in the meanwhile, uh, I'll ask one of my own, uh, which is, uh, so right, what do you make of uh, the, in, in the present moment, I think, I think we are obviously, so much is happening in the world and we're in a very complicated political climate. And we talked earlier, uh, you described uh, the, the building of the nation state, for example. Uh, so what, what do you make in uh, what do you make of the role of fiction in a time like this? Because you, it's the novelists who engage quite extensively with some of the issues that we discussed. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to invite everybody to, to our sameness through writing. And this nationalism, which is a product of 19th century, before 19th century, there is no such thing in sociology. We study this. The, imagined communities, Benedict Anderson talks about that, how communities started to imagine themselves as separate entities. So I become Turkish, you become Greek and this and that. Um, I think it's the most poisonous ideology of our times. Mm -hmm. And we have to go beyond this nationalism and see what's unique. We are all here in a very, very short time and we will die. If we can remember our own mortality, that will bring us together and that will make us equals because in the face of death, there is no up or down or this or that. We are all mortals. So I, I'm trying to bring awareness, which is actually what yoga does. So I'm taking this from yoga. You have to remember everything is passing. There's only one thing that's, that's permanent. It's prusha. It's your soul. So stick to that, and that will connect you to other beings everywhere in the world. And as a novelist, yes, I try to do that. Um, another question is coming. Uh, Aryan Rawat asks, do you want each book to stand on its own, or are you trying to build a body of work mm -hmm. with connections between each book? Well, I want them to stand alone, actually. And I, I, but then they become a whole, like even though I try to build them separately because they are my children, they have the same genetical structure. And I think it's, it's happening on its own. There are certain things an author cannot control and this is one of them. 
you try to create something unique and then it connects itself to the previous one or to the next one. Uh, I mean, I for one definitely want to read a novel about Avinash Pillai. <laughs> That's true, and it's in my heart. I will, I'm going to write one about Avinash. Everybody wanted to read more about Avinash. <laughs> um, Rohit Jaku asks, "What is your favorite underappreciated novel?" Underappreciated novel? Wow, I don't know. I have to think about that. Um, I don't know. I need a little time to think for that. Is there, okay, let me ask a slightly different question. Is there a novel in the Turkish that you really want to get translated into English so that it uh, also reaches readers like me? Yes, we have a, a writer, her name is Ay Ayfer Tunç, and she has this book which is called um, The Falsely Told Story of a Crazy House. This is how it's the falsely told story of a crazy house. And it's an amazing novel. But all the books of Ifar Tunj I would like to see in English and reaching to more audiences because, it, again, it's talking about something very universal and, uh, and very local. So both I, that combination is always a good one. I'm sure the publishers watching this session are taking notes. I hope notes. so. I, I know Tunch. I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> Rohini Ayer asks, you said you were working on a book based 100 years ahead. Is there any impact of today's pandemic woven into your new book? Yes. I, do you read my book? I want to <laughs> ask. <laughs> um, yes, it's actually taking place during the third pandemic. This one being the first. So there's going to be a second and then the, my book, the new book, is taking place during the times of the third pandemic. So we can say yes. So, I mean, after three pandemics, has the human race got any better at dealing with pandemics? No, no. Worse and worse. And in the third, there's nothing to do. They, they surrender. <laughs> they don't even try. Uh, so this novel, you said, is out in Turkish very soon? It will be out, yes, in Turkish very soon, in about two weeks, I think. Now we're doing the cover. We're like so close to the end. Like it's, it's out of me. It's out of my hands. And will it be out in English uh, afterwards? Yes, my dear translator is working on my, um, on my fourth, third novel now. Once she's finished the translation of that one, we will start translating this and then it will be available, hopefully. Excellent. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> Um, Manasi Chauhan asks, what are, your, what are the common traps for aspiring writers? What advice do you have for aspiring and struggling writers like us? Uh, well, I'm a struggling writer too, first of all. You're not alone. Not, the, the fact that you're having your books published and translated doesn't mean you're not struggling. Like when you look at it, you go to a bookstore, you look and you say, oh my God, so many books are written and what is mine? which is taking all my life force from me. And it's just the one book in this giant world of books. So, but, so that's the struggle part. What I will say, always write. That's the thing, all right? Writing is making sentences, forming sentences. Even sentences don't make sense. Even if it's not up to your standards, keep writing, forming the sentences one after another and every day like a ritual. Open notebook writing is always amazing. I find it when I write with my hand, especially at the beginning of a project, if I'm looking for inspiration, writing by hand opens some part of the brain that is not activated when typing. And typing, it's, it happens in your computer. And your computer is a place where you do other things, which will distract you. So better write by hand and then once it starts scrolling, you can come and write. And I always close internet and everything when I write. Like single focus, the book wants a lot from you. Try to give that to the book and then it will give back to you. That was lovely. Um, I, I think on that note, we're almost out of time. So, Daphne, thank you so much. I just, I learned so much from you in this conversation. It was really lovely. Well, 
I want to thank you. And this is an amazing opportunity for me to reach like all these people who are watching. Um, I want to thank you all for inviting me. This was amazing. Thank you, Daphne Suman. And thank you, Manasi Subramaniam. As you said, the book needs, needs your full attention and only then will it give back. And as you said, also, there's only one permanent thing and that's the soul. Daphne, I don't know whether you know, sort of Turkey is the favorite destination of most Indian weddings. Uh, you know, oh. and of us would <laughs> love to come for, for holidays uh, there. So in these last few years, pre-lockdown, pre there were millions of dollars of weddings that happened in Bodrum and in Antale and Cappadocia and Izmir, etc. So, you know, it is the favorite sort of Indian uh, destination. That's we amazing. Find, I didn't know about it. <laughs> yeah, we find it very exotic, you know, whether it's Konya or all of these wonderful places. And we have a festival there. We run India by the Bosphorus, which happens every year. We couldn't do it this year, but hopefully we'll be there next year. And we'll have- Well, you. I would love to attend. Thank you when so much. When it happens, much. I'll you, make my way. Yes, thank you both so much. And best wishes uh, for the book. And thank you all for watching. And please do remember to lock back on on Friday, the 16th of October to watch another set of great sessions. We've got Virtuoso, we sang we in conversation with Pragya Tiwari, India's leading food writer and celebrated editor and TV anchor. We sang we takes us on a fascinating journey through his life and times with his sharp eyed observations on changing society and challenges of a new political landscape. And this is at 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time. 2.30 p.m. British Standard Time and 9.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And that's followed by And Three Women, Lisa Tadeo in conversation with Ira Trivedi. Lisa Tadeo's latest book, The Three Women, is a worldwide sensation which explores the intricate depths of the female heart in all its passion, heartbreak, and intimacy. And this will be at 8.30 p.m. IST, 4 p.m. British Standard Time, and 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Meanwhile, remember, beginning tomorrow, we've got India by the way. Over the past five years, this particular festival has become Hong Kong's landmark cultural gathering on the strength of its rich and diverse programming, which fuses the classical and contemporary across art, music, dance, theater, food, literature, film, and wellness. India by the Bay runs from 15th to 18th of October 2020 every evening with wellness yoga with Daniel Simpson tomorrow, Zaika food creativity and lockdown with chef Romy Gill and chef Piku. And then we've got East and West music, a legacy of Shubendra Rao and Saskia with Tijo Manshwing. And we conclude with Churchill hero or anti-hero Shashi Tharoor in conversation with Dr. Mukulika Banerjee from the LSE. And of course, for those of you who missed are broadcast on the 4th of October of I Believe Art Matters. Please remember that we're repeating this on the 18th, which is Sunday. As you all know, given the large scale need for financial assistance in the cultural sector, Teamwork is curating a multi-arts charity event, I Believe Art Matters. The initiative raises financial support and resources for over 5,000 artists and artisans and celebrates their craft and their traditions by bringing their stories to the forefront. Scheduled for October 18th, I Believe Art Matters is hosted by actor Shabana Azmi and Manoj Bajpai and will premiere on Facebook, weaving together over 400 uh, performers for six and a half hours, including A.R. Rahman, Salim Suleiman, Shekhar Ravjiani and the Shilong Chamber Choir, Ranjit Barrett, uh, Usha Uttup, Selva Ganesh and Shivamani, Vikubin Ayakram, uh, the Nritya Gram Dance Foundation, Aditi Mangaldas, Ashley Lobo, Malavika Sarukai, Shilpika Bordoloi, and a slew of theater and great stand-up comedy with Papa CJ, Abish Matthew, Radhika Vaz, and Varun Grover. So remember, do tune in at 6 p.m. Indian Standard Time on Sunday the 18th and help us help artists. Thank you, stay safe, stay masked, and see you on Friday.